change the title. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm going to come on. I thought I might, uh, having listened to Vincent Gore yesterday and a little bit of chat about Unistro, um, I thought I'd like to, to, to add a little bit in on this. is the second part of something that I've been working on, trying to give a background to, uh, to the Unistro Order, um, which is obviously a second, probably a late second century BC. Uh, artifact much discussed, and uh, and Herodotus obviously three three centuries earlier. Um, I sort of begin by talking about the idea of the Celtic diaspora. I mean, you probably I don't know whether anybody here can identify these two pictures, but the first one is someone who looks quite Celtic um, in the classical world in 1972. Um, David Gilmore and Pink Floyd Light on and on the on the right, you can see um, some other people who might call Celts, because they're playing Carnesses and um, they're playing live at the Sanctuary Stupa in northern India, um, which is a, a, a Maurian Empire foundation, um, um, which I'll talk about a little later. And that's, um, I suppose, that, that, that Carnex theme is one of the, it is it's something that really interests me. We've got, from Scotland, from Tontanyak, the uh, more recently discovered one. And they obviously they appear here on the Grimsworth Cauldron, um, where there is a, there's a row of, of, of Carnix blowers, of three Carnix blowers who appear here. And that's one of the reasons that people often say, oh, the Grimsworth Cauldron is a, is a Celtic artifact, um, because it, it, it would appear to depict um, people using that ten equipment. And there are other things about it which we won't talk about in great detail today, so that's just the way it talks. Shield types, weapon types, helmet types, so um, like the you know, the, fake, the, 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 the bird headed helmet, which is parallel to the um, Transylvanian Celtic grain at Chumash, etc. etc. Um, and here you can see the, the stupa at Sanchi, where we've got probably musicians from uh, many lands being depicted. Uh, this is probably a Thracian or Phrygian uh, piper, and, and, uh, and then we've got some people who may be even physically depicting uh, ethnic differences of people within the Maurian Empire under, under Ashoka or Ashoka's uh, um, successor, um, with this possibly a depiction of people at the <coughs> Obviously, this is art. We have to remember that we have got images which are icons, they form parts of iconographies, those form parts of iconologies, and those in turn are symbolic. And, and therefore, I mean, we can't go into that in detail, but obviously it lies behind any of the sorts of comments or um, oversimplifications that one has to make in a presentation like this, that ultimately we're interested in implications and, and effects, but we have to work through a series of, 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 of other um, if you like, um, structures of meaning to, 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 to understand that. Um, what we've got, obviously, with, in Sanchi and in Brunastro and, and, and is that we've got a, a reflexive aspect of representation, that is, we're seeing the secondary depiction of, uh, of, of artistic artifacts. And we're also looking at the projection of identity, and um, something we were talking about in the field earlier, in the view of the Henrietta Moore's idea that, that the idea of identity is actually a concept <coughs> metaphor. Um, it, it, it basically allows us to begin to think about uh, uh, something which is brought into being by thinking about it, what, what is identity. And um, broadly here, we could just say that identity, the various people have already said things about identity, but it is reflexive. Uh, it's variously asserted, projected, felt, and imposed within social and other contexts that are themselves at least partially characterizable in terms of identity negotiation. You need to negotiate your identity, or it will be negotiated for you. Um, and both is often true. And there are obviously concentrated points at which identity uh, comes to, a, to the front um, in, in, right, in read passage, for example, but there are lots of Diluted examples of identity presentation. Gunsel Golden is really 
uh, I think one shouldn't doubt that it's a very dense presentation of identities. There are, uh, the more you look into the, the icons and the iconography, you can see that there's a very, very distinct way in which individuals on that quadrant are presented and groups are presented uh, with a great amount of care. One, that's a, sort of a book length, you know, seven day lecture to go through each of those. Uh, each of those, and, that, and we can't do it today. But what I do want to say is that the background to it, three centuries earlier, is a situation of, of immense of like ethnic and identity complexity, which begins to be captured for us for the first time by an artist who had found out around 450 BC, who, um, this is not his map, but my map of his, of his world, um, but he, he talks about um, all d different places and different identities and groups nested within those places, Scythia, Thrace, India, I've shaded these two here because he makes a comparison between the sizes of the populations of those places um, but his, uh, and the peoples within them. And um, you, his, he lies behind a lot of the maps that we make or are compelled to make and John talks a lot about you know, how to get rid of Celtic and things, but we, uh, you want, I have to write, you know, Celtic art section in the Millen Dictionary of Art, years ago, what you do, you're asked to do it, so you have to do two pages, and you produce a map like this, um, you know, um, trying to push it all into uh, several centuries into one, and then you find that the, the culture <coughs> of the historian called the, the uh, Caucasus, the Carpathians, so a lovely map that you, you thought you'd <laughs> You'd work for. And there's this thing going on. You've got the, you've got a, you've got something going on with Latin. You've got something going on with Scythians, and this is what Chris Gosman was talking about uh, yesterday. I think there's a there's a coming together somewhere in Eastern Europe. Um, uh, I asked a question at the Cambridge uh, Symposium three years ago. You know, could Latin be at least in part a reflex of state phenomena? <coughs> I, I think that that in some ways has to be the case. Um, we have to remember that we often talk about, say, Greek art or Scythian art or Celtic art, but it's ethno, ethno, ethno uh, We give it an ethnic identifier. But um, I'm particularly interested actually in, in this area of Southeast Europe where we see a fusion. If you think of Slovenian Matan or you think of the Scythian animal style or you think of Archaemenid style, that's from the Rogazen Horn in, in Bulgaria. The, uh, came in metropolitan product, or you can see elements of all of those in, for example, Thracian horse hides, which are beginning to fuse animal style with vegetative motifs with um, uh, 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 some um, geometrical depth of precision. And that's um, something which would be interesting. There are two aspects we've got Thracian art of, of Thracian. Uh, one is the more decorative side, and the other is a more narrative side, um, which is really influenced uh, particularly by the, uh, by, the, by the classical world. Um, and we can, I mean, I've argued long after the, the, the fourth century, um, Fasciase, the sort of Thrapogetic art, is um, carrying over using a lot of Achaemenid Persian models, ideas of Achaemenid Persian. Kingship is an iconography of power which, um, uh, re, which positions the, the uh, ruler as a predator or a sacrificer um, who, who is aggressive uh, towards animals and towards other people. So the, uh, there's, a, there's an embodiment of kingship which is taken over probably on a, on a model of, of Xerxes and is imported into, European, uh, into, into a more European context. Um, Gundestrup clearly belongs to uh, this more narrative rather than decorative uh, tradition. It's, it's um, technically, it's quite clearly uh, Southeast European Toriutic work. Um, there's no doubt about that. It fits into the tradition of <clears throat> uh, Greek or Italian trained or metropolitan trained gold and silversmiths doing um, what one might call graphic ethnography. Um, there are lots of examples of pictures where explicit ideas of what does a Scythian look like. And this is, these are Scythians, if you like, 
represented to themselves as a kind of Stygian graves, but are clearly worked within um, probably a Greek colonial context. And Michael Frommer's work on the Tostano uh, Gila Pectoral is a classic example of showing how the South Etrurian uh, goldsmith is, is effectively commissioned to uh, produce ethnographic pictures of uh, Stygian pastoral life for uh, consumption, in this case, in, in the Tosta. So Gunster fits into that, but it's a little, it's a little later. It's obviously uh, it has a different kind of style of um, of, of um, uh, iconography. Um, Anders Bergqvist and I, now back in '87, tried to discuss mechanisms by which it could have been made uh, down here and transported as some sort of a booty. Uh, up to Scandinavia. I don't want to go into that at, at the moment. There obviously is a number of mechanisms. But what's important to note now is the is the actual like the, the, the very fine grained connections. If we look at the central um, the bowl with the repair in it, it has this this uh, phalera, it's a butting ball phalera, a circular piece of silver, um, which has been put in there to patch a repair so at one point comes into the foreground. And that's a, a, a phalera of a, of a very well-known class, uh, the sort of Sark class phalera, which we uh, were known from a hoard um, uh, of, of such plates found on the Channel Island of Sark in the 18th century, along with ghetto Dacian coins. And uh, those were, were being reported by uh, Dan Gallagher and among others. Um, this is another of the South Plus family, and one of my predecessors in Vienna, Ricardo Pitioni, um, rather willfully tried to position Gunnstrup, I think, in a, in a, in a sort of Western Massilian context, by saying, well, this obviously must be one of Hannibal's elephants, and therefore, you know, the parallels would be to, to sort, of a, sort of a coin of this. Whereas the better, far better parallels are to the phalery of northern India, to the Marian Empire. This is one in the British Museum um, from Royal Hindi, um, probably a little later, but probably 1st century BC, 1st century AD. And uh, in 92, I graphed a, a distribution of these and the subclass ones, which are from here, where we, where we get a dotion points. We know they're being made in, uh, in Bulgaria, Stars of Dora, and so on. Here's the, here's the one. Uh, uh, in South Russia uh, and and over here in the east. They're sort of lacking a bit in between, and that's probably a visibility in the museum problem. You can see the direction of flow, however, if you look at the uh, lotus uh, the lotus band here, which by the time you get to if you like, Bulgaria, the Chinese whispers have degraded that into something that's, if you like, less perfectly understood. Just like you to hang on to the idea of a woman with a bird on each shoulder and neck rings and tresses, because we'll come back to that. This is a, a fellow from Galice in Bulgaria. So I've been going to look after the book as I've got Eastern connections, um, the direction of Rural Pindi, and a better explanation for the elephants on the Gunnstra cauldron. Uh, not Hannibal, but um, as I would argue, a version, these are versions of um, quite well-known Hindu deity types. So this is the illustration of Sri Lakshmi by elephants. She uh, sits on a flower, has lotus flowers around her, and the elephants come up from either side uh, to bathe her. And uh, there are many representations of Lakshmi. If we look at this from the corner, we can see here is the like the Galiche woman, this is someone with a bird of his shoulder, uh, hair and tresses, attendant figures, probably a child uh, feeding. And that is uh, the companion piece in the British Museum from uh, Royal Finley. You can also see the twin birds here, smaller attendant figures. And we know in this case that this is Hariti, or later known as Sibilia, the protectress of children. So those are, these are types, these are named types, which we have within the Hindu pantheon. Uh, and um, if we look on this, we only see this uh, structure, which is also often being described as Taranis, uh, if you're thinking in, you know, Mount Green, uh, sort of Celtic 
concepts, or is it, or is it the Jupiter? Um, probably the, the closest um, parallel for this, although I think so, is a picture of King Ashoka uh, himself, the Marian Empire, with the, uh, with the 16 spoked wheel of, uh, of command. Uh, uh, Chakradhara, the wheel of the law, as so as the Chakravati holds the wheel of the law. 16 spokes is important. You can actually see this as a half, you can see half the wheel here, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We've got eight spokes on that. So we're clearly seeing a transmission of, um, of an iconography of power, in this case, not a Xerxian one, but a, uh, a, a, uh, a rather later one. And um, we could maybe talk about this in, in, in a little bit. But uh, the question that I'd ask is then, could the, the king image of the 5th century BC Zerbs is the great fighter of lions, or sees the lion and kills bulls, which is transmuted into Trachagetigart in, in the 4th uh, and 3rd centuries BC. Uh, is, could that be fashionably replaced by the same first centuries by uh, an Eastern uh, in Eastern Central Europe, by the Central Power, based on the 3rd century BC marriage and Emperor Ashoka. Um, I produced this set of ideas, of young visual ideas, um, back in 92, um, and it wasn't very easy, I think, for people to accept that there might be such systematic connections because Sean Goodstrom is killed it, and this is in um, and I, I maybe I presented it in a directly provocative way on Scientific America, looking <coughs> at parallels to, um, to, to religious postures and to religious functions. Um, that's probably another, uh, something for another day. But I want to come round to what should have been like the original um, uh, focus of the lecture, which is Herodotus. So the background to all of this is, is an immense ethnic complexity. This is another graph. Of Herodotus's view of Thrace and Scythia, in which one can see that when you look at the terms he uses, there is a tremendous, uh, uh, there's a tremendous depth of, of, of knowledge and a tremendous um, uh, nuancing of, of ethnic terms. That he uses one and the same term in different contexts to mean different things, and. Uh, there are hierarchies within his ethnic names. We have uh, and, and associations, both historical, linguistic, and if you like, cultural. Uh, he describes polyethnic situations, multi-ethnic situations, and situations of movement with uh, uh, ethnic grade groups and places, groups such as the Sigini, who are nomadic, uh, maybe nomadic service ethnic. Separately to the Nuri, the Agathosi, for example, or uh, the Agathosi Scythian or Thracian and so on. And the Keltoi are always on, a little bit on the fringe of that whole framing. So, uh, to cut it very short, um, the, uh, I think that in this later Iron Age context, we've got a whole set of very complex social identities. At the divine realm, we've got a set of individuals who have identities uh, which are being negotiated across the Eurasian zone. I don't want to say goods represents Hindu deities, that would be a sort of a ludicrous oversimplification. What I mean is that there are a set of ideas out there, divine identities. There are a set of elite identities. How do you become an elite person? What is your relationship with some of those gods? Uh, there are ritual realms, there's a service realm, and there's an unfree realm. We'll talk about that on, on, on another occasion. The unfree realm, which is probably the largest of all of those in terms of personnel. But um, if we try to understand the range of Herodotus' identity types to find out custom language, location, appearance, social status, economic role, and so on, requires us to move both up and down scale. Up scale, we have what can be termed the Eurasian network, I've thought of that for a while, I think, uh, which integrates the old world Iron Age technical complex at the broadest level. And down scale, we will deal with limited interest groups, that are called links, 
of varying status of power that articulated with it. So, um, what this is sort of my solution. I mean, other people have given other solutions today, or this is my terminology, but we've got these identity hubs that we talk about, which, which we often, which I think about as sort of traditional cultural historical cultures, um, foci, Latin Celts, or Syrians, or whatever, where, however those uh, were perceived in the past or by us now, but they're suspended in, within networks, and I think in particular there's this East-West Eurasian network, and uh, those are permeated by groups such as silversmiths, um, or ritual specialists who are transmitting information um, through movement, through uh, patronage, through clientage, um, through a whole variety of mechanisms. Uh, they're integrating uh, nodes within, within that broader picture. And I think one's got to understand that sort of complexity if we're going to make sense of something like the Thank you.